Hey everyone, it's Brian from Ultimate Upland, and uh, as we get closer to the season, I think we're about a week away from most of the seasons across the country opening, I thought I'd walk you guys through some of the things that we look at when we're planning our season and where we are going to hunt. Um, because I think there's a lot that goes into it. Um, some people, uh, when they think about upland bird hunting, they just go, well, I'm just going to hit the standards. Uh, I'm just going to go to South Dakota because uh, I know that there's pheasants there, or uh, I'm going to go to Georgia because I hear there's quail there. And really what we like to do is we like to take a little bit broader approach and look at what's going on around the country. Also realize that the forecasts are coming out here soon. Roadside counts. Some states still do them. A lot of states aren't doing them anymore. That's been kind of a hot topic here because South Dakota decided that they were going to end their roadside count or at least end the publishing of their August roadside count. So we won't have a bird trend anymore. Uh, a forecast for how many birds there are in the state of South Dakota. And really, when you look at it across the country, if you're not hunting pheasant, uh, and in some cases quail, but it's mainly a pheasant and quail thing, uh, most of the birds aren't surveyed. So the forecasts aren't going to include lots of other species of birds, uh, like your grouse or ptarmigan, uh, chucker. Those types of birds aren't generally included in any kind of count. So if you're trying to find upland birds or trying to decide where you're going to go find upland birds, what do you look at then to help you factor uh, where you're going to go? Now, of course, you could uh, listen to the state forecast. Uh, so upland bird biologists, yeah, the issue is, is that they work for the state and those state agencies are funded by license sales. So if I'm a bird biologist in a state where there's upland birds, and I know that the funding for my agency comes from license sales, am I more likely to give a dire prediction or maybe just hedge a little bit on positivity? And I think that's what you see in general, and, and, and that's not a knock on those guys that are being paid through those license sales, essentially, uh, and certainly have other people to answer to. So um, when I see uh, those forecasts, uh, when I see them come out via the state, I do like to look at the raw data underneath those forecasts if there is raw data. If they've done roadside counts, there's something really good about going and digging into that data and seeing what the actual trends are. And upland birds, generally, their, their populations and their uh, prevalence are based on trends. Uh, so a single year snapshot of what the bird population is really isn't a very good snapshot of what's going on. So when a bird biologist says, we've had a 25% increase in the number of birds in the state, you go, oh, that's great. Possibly what's being left out of that story is for the last three years, we've had a 40% decline year over year over year. So for three years, we're down 40%, but this year in relation to that, we're up 25%. So we're looking good. The fats can all be molded towards what narrative you're trying to create. So what we try and do when we're planning a season is we're trying to get beneath that, uh, narrative. Uh, take out all of the uh, of the speculation and just go with what we know about upland birds. So one of the primary tools we use when we're doing that is the drought monitor. Um, and I've been watching it all season uh, since spring. Um, if you guys don't know about the drought monitor, you can see it on ultimateupland.com on every state has the drought monitor as its primary piece because drought or the lack of surface water or the abundance of surface water has a lot to do with whether or not we're going to see upland birds or how upland birds are doing in any given area. So as you can see, this is from March 16th, essentially the beginning of spring. Uh, and you can take this all the way back through the winter if you want to look at it and you can and push it forwards. And also one other thing we look at besides the drought monitor when I was talking about winter, and one thing that we do look at is we look at how hard winters have been in any given area. A lot of times you'll get that via national news, but if say a state has had a particularly difficult winter, then you can pretty much expect that the birds over winter have had a hard time surviving. The survival rate's going to be lower. So uh, even leading into spring, we'll be looking at winter and we'll be seeing what places and what states have had 
particularly difficult winters and factor that into where we're going to plan for the following year. But let's talk about spring. So this is in March, March 16th. This is the drought monitor for March 16th and it shows the entire country. And yes, you've got your uh, legend over here. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but really what you need to look at here in March 16th is red is bad. Uh, even orange is fairly bad. Uh, anything orange or darker is severe drought. You go, what does that mean? Well, what what that means is, is that when you have drought, uh, severe drought in springtime, you're going to have a hard time getting crops to germinate. Uh, the amount of cover that's going to be produced, habitat in the area is going to be lesser. Uh, and just water sources uh, in, in the desert areas, water sources for birds, it's key to their uh, survival and to, to their thriving. So when you have less surface water, the birds are going to be less likely to thrive. So in March or early spring across the bulk of the country, I'd say a full half of the country has some level of drought. So I take that into effect and I go, wow, this, this isn't looking good. Um, so I will step you forward here and I'll go, okay, well, so this is from August, uh, the beginning of August. So the entire summer, now, as you can see from one to the next, there has been some change. Some areas have gotten surface water and have gotten some moisture, and that's good news. Uh, sp specifically, if I look at Texas, if you look at Texas in the spring and then you look at Texas in the summer, Texas has gotten some moisture. I think some of that can be attributed maybe to hurricane season or just generally storms. So that's great. Um, but the other thing you're going to notice is, is that some of the areas that were in yellow have now gone to red. And what that means is they've uh, gone from being abnormally dry to extreme drought. Now, again, what does that mean and why am I looking at it across time? The reason I'm looking at, uh, at it across time is because a snapshot uh, uh, of just one month doesn't necessarily give you the full picture. It could be dry in the spring and yet we could get some moisture and crops would be fine and then going into the summer and later into the fall things would change and habitat would change. But the longer a drought persists the harder it's going to be on all wildlife including upland birds. So now I'm looking at August, beginning of August, and now we can see that yes the drought monitor, according to the drought monitor, again, about half the country or maybe a, a third of the country is in drought. And the problem is, is that the, uh, uh, there's a very hefty portion that is in extreme drought. Now, the areas that are in lighter orange um, that are moderately dry, uh, for upland birds, I'm going to I'm going to give that there's that, that may not be fully impactful for upland birds. Um, Severe drought, though, what I would be, uh, you know, uh, looking at is, is that there's going to be a pretty substantial decline in upland birds, especially in quail um, and probably ptarmigan country, as well as some uh, grouse country. Uh, now, again, most of the eastern half of the country looks pretty good. Uh, the little abnormally dry sections we've got in West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, they don't really concern me right now. If I take a quick jump backwards, not forwards, backwards, I can look and see, well, okay, so those yellow sections have been moving, except for maybe this piece of Maine up here. But okay, we're okay for the bulk of the eastern part of the country, but there's been a persistent drought in the western part of the country, especially west of the Mississippi, uh, the northwest very specifically. And so now you go, I've heard this before from folks online. Well, it's the desert. We're talking about the desert southwest because there's lots of species of quail down there, fun to chase. Uh, you, you'll have guys go, well, that's just the desert. The desert's going to be dry. Well, that's not what this drought monitor measures. It's, it's, a, it, it's a comparative, and here's what the drought classification is, if you will. It tells you what they're looking at, and it also tells you how they're getting that. So you can think that it's just going to be dry in the desert, right? That's what you're going to say is that that's not doesn't mean that it's drought. No, it, they can still determine whether there's a drought in the desert based on the precipitation over time and lots of different indexes. So again, what we're looking at here and kind of the no-go zones for us are anything from severe drought through exceptional drought. And if you look at this, it will also give you a really good clue as to what exactly we're talking about and why upland birds might be impacted from that, right? So... D2 severe drought, or the orange color, 
crop or pasture loss is likely, water shortage is common, water restrictions imposed. We go, okay, well, if crop and pasture losses are likely, then that probably means that there's not going to be cover or food in those areas, either for upland game or any kind of animal, right? So the, the D2 severe trout's pretty serious in this regard to where we want to consider hunting. We go to extreme drought, major crop and pasture losses, widespread water shortages and restrictions, and then if you go just to the exceptional drought, you go, okay, well, exceptional widespread crop and pasture losses. So essentially it's just compounding, right? And the, the D2 through D4 really is an expression of time, how bad it's been over time or how bad it's been as, as, in terms of how much less than normal precipitation there is. So the drought monitor is something that we really keep a good eye on uh, throughout the spring and into the summer to try and help us determine where it is we're going to go. So if I go back up and I look and I go, well, what does that leave, right? Well, the bad news is for folks who would go to the traditional hot spots of, say, South Dakota. Well, the bulk of the state in South Dakota has been in a drought for the entire spring and summer. So it started out in the spring not terrible, but it has progressed pretty badly. If I look at the state of Montana, Montana is dry, dry. The whole southeastern side of Montana is dry, dry. The bulk of northern Idaho, where you'd be thinking of uh, chucker hunting possibly, Hell's Canyon up there, of course, very dry. And the entire state of California, not that there's that many people who upline in California anymore because we're not even sure you're allowed to use guns in California anymore, but there is some decent upland bird populations out there, extremely dry. Uh, I think the one that really stands out to me, though, on this map uh, for late summer is the state of Utah. Utah, great place to hunt upland birds, lots of species, lots of grouse, chucker, uh, ptarmigan, uh, even pheasant. The entire state of Utah is in a massive drought, a severe drought. And so that probably, for me, makes Utah a no-go zone this year. Uh, you got some New Mexico and Arizona, although lesser. But so what I do then, just to help me um, assess this even further, uh, is I go and I overlay both those maps, right? So what I'll do is I take away all of the colors that don't alert me too terribly. Anything that's uh, light orange to yellow, I just get rid of that. I take those off the map, and then what I do is I overlay those two maps, and then I basically only leave the pieces that are left that have been from spring all the way to summer. These are the places that are severely drought, or in, 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 a, in a fairly significant drought from the entire length of time, over that course of time. So I don't, I've taken away all the yellow, all of the light orange, and I've only left the places that are pretty severely drought impacted this year. And so based on that, what I'm looking at and what I said before was you can see the state of Utah, pretty bad. Nevada, yeah, pretty bad. Um, you know, parts of Oregon, not good. Uh, I think the one that's going to really impact people is North and South Dakota. If I'm looking at the longer term pieces of that, if I were planning to go to South Dakota, I might avoid that northwest corner because it's been in drought the entire time. Uh, North Dakota, anything except for this eastern part of the state, I might avoid that. Um, if I'm looking at Iowa even, uh, you can see in Iowa there's a, there, there's a section of drought. I'm going to go back up and look at that again, actually. Oh, okay. So the, the section in Iowa that was kind of in drought is this northwest corner. So if I'm looking to hunt in Iowa, although I think Iowa's uh, still one of the states that does uh, really good roadside counts and does a decent accounting of their birds. But if I was looking at hunting in Iowa this year, I probably would avoid that northwest corner. Um, because as you can see, that's been in drought for a while. I think the, the highlights for me would be that there's uh, Nebraska and Kansas certainly have uh, uh, managed to uh, move out of the drought. Uh, if you're a quail hunter, I'd certainly look at Oklahoma as being a potential to go. Um, obviously, some good news up in, say, Michigan. Uh, if you're a grouse hunter, that's good news for you up there, although drought not nearly as impactful to woodland species. But, uh, yeah, a, a Michigan certainly would be a good opportunity. And, of course, you know, if, uh, anything uh, basically east of the Mississippi, if I'm looking at this, 
is a, is a go zone, although you're going to have less birds than you would have in some of those western states. Uh, Minnesota was in a drought. I think they were in a drought late. Let's look at that real quick. Yeah, so that's going to be a question for me. Um, the bulk of the state of Minnesota was fairly drought impacted late. Now, there's a lot of surface water in Minnesota, so it may not have as big an impact. And early, let's see, early they were just in a light drought. Minnesota might still be an okay go zone um, in terms of what you're looking at here. Uh, so yeah, th that's kind of what I would look at. And what I do is I just try and rule out. Like this, these are the places that I'm probably not gonna go um, just because of the impact of the birds and the broader sense of things. Of course, Texas, if you wanna go hunt quail, it'd be a great place to go this year. Um, probably late in the season. I don't know what their hatches have been, but hopefully they've got some good counts out. Texas, Texas Wildlife and Parks does a really good job of counting as well. And I think that their counts will come out. Uh, and, and I like their reports in, mo in most cases. So those are the places I'd be looking at in terms of drought. Now the other thing that we can talk about is uh, CRP. <laughs> The CRP program through the USDA, um, they allow emergency haying and grazing. And what that means is, is that if your county is eligible because of a drought or some other disaster, they will make your county eligible to both graze and hay after the nesting season is over. So most nesting seasons end in, I believe, uh, May or early June, I think, and in that in the, in the event that your county is eligible for CRP haying, if your land is in a CRP program uh, or grazing, um, they will let you know, and then you can either put cattle on it or you can cut that grass. There are some limitations to that, and it depends on the level of drought and lots of other rules, but uh, simply put that these are the counties that are eligible since October 1st, 2020, that are eligible for emergency haying and grazing. Now, what that's going to mean for you in terms of the field is that um, all these places that are sometimes dual enrolled, say a, a uh, landowner has their land in the CRP program, but they've also enrolled it in the walk-in hunting program of the state. Lots of that happens in South Dakota, uh, North Dakota, uh, Kansas, a lot of that's going on. So what that means is, is that um, a lot of those of that acreage where you normally could hunt or where birds would normally be uh, uh, has, has potential to be mowed down to nothing. So when I look at this emergency haying and gra grazing map, I go, wow, I have never seen this many counties in, uh, allowed to emergency hay and graze ever. And I keep pretty good track of this. So uh, almost half of the country is uh, eligible for emergency haying and grazing. That's insane. Um, and it has to do with the level of drought that we've seen. Now, obviously a lot of Texas is still in that emergency haying and grazing and you go, well, they're out of the drought. Why is that? Well, the, it, they, they determine it earlier on in the year. So once they're eligible, they're eligible. What we found from our experience out West is, is if a CRP acreage is eligible for emergency haying and grazing, then uh, about nine times out of ten, the people will actually hay and graze it because then they can take that and sell that uh, sell that hay or use the hay, obviously, if they need to. I'm not knocking on the land or that uh, it's their prerogative. But uh, what you've got here is, is you've got basically the entire states of North and South Dakota are uh, eligible for emergency haying and grazing. A lot of Nebraska, the almost the entire state of Minnesota, Montana, Wyoming. Idaho. I mean, basically the entire West is eligible. The CRP acreage is eligible for emergency haying and grazing. So that doesn't bode well for bird numbers. So I, if, if I'm looking now at how I plan a season out and where I'm potentially going, I look at those acres and I go, okay, well, any one of these states that generally has a walk-in program that is a supplement to that CRP program by the USDA, um, there's a very good chance that I'll then pull up to those walk-ins and they will be sheared. And that's frustrating as frustrating can be. Um, so when you're a public land hunter and you pull up to these places that are supposed to have cover and they don't have cover because they've been grazed or uh, hayed, then that gets super frustrating. And so you can look, if I'm looking at this map, I go, uh-oh, um, we're really in trouble in terms of <laughs> where I'm going to try and find places to hunt. It's just going to make things more difficult. And what also happens from this then is that if you're a public land hunter, 
there's lots, there's going to be lots of those plots that have been sheared, cut, or grazed. And what it does is it then concentrates other public land hunters to the remaining spots. So I think you're going to have a lot of that going on. Just be aware of it. If you decide you're going to go to South Dakota to hunt in South Dakota, know that there's going to be fewer spots with good habitat that will hold birds. And those spots, everybody else is going to concentrate on them too. So if you're a public land hunter, what I'm going to say to you in those uh, areas where there's green is be prepared to drive a lot, walk a lot, and hit areas that aren't, uh, that are further from the truck. Um, so that's what I'd be looking at there. Uh, and then the last thing I think I'm going to look at in terms of just a very broad sense of planning for the season is I'm going to look at wildfires. Um, and wildfires, the act of wildfires, what they do is um, a lot of times if they're in national forests or around public lands, that's going to be an impact of both the campgrounds in that area. It's certainly an impact of the habitat. It's an impact of the air quality. It's very fairly broad impact. And, and fire seasons really just... Uh, starting to flare up now, though I'm sure you've seen some uh, of the massive fires that are going on in California, but this was just a quick screenshot of the active fires that we had. I think this was from last week. I think there's probably some additional now, but if I'm looking at those active fires and the color of the fires, obviously, but really what I'm looking at right now is the concentration of them. And if I look up here in Idaho and Western Montana, some Washington and of course Oregon and California, like the whole northwest corner of the state is on fire. At least it appears so in this. Now that's not true because they're broad areas, but it certainly is going to factor into where I would try to hunt. Now if I'm thinking of going to Montana based on what I've seen in the drought map and based on the wild wildfires, I'm obviously going to try and stay closer to eastern Montana. Um, Idaho, I certainly would try and stay in the south part of Idaho. You know, California, again, northern California is just fully on fire. And of course, you've got a few fires here in Colorado in the mountains. Uh, uh, those, those are smaller fires and I haven't heard a lot about those, but it's certainly something else that we're going to look at when we're going to plan a hunt. So those are kind of the factors uh, uh, when, when we're looking at where we want to travel hunt or how we're going to try and plan out the season. Now, understand also that... Uh, even though the drought map is dire and the emergency hanging map is, is, is certainly dire, there's um, what we call microclimates, I guess. That may not be the appropriate word, but just because a whole state is, uh, is showing drought doesn't necessarily mean that there's not going to be places in there that you'll be able to find birds and that birds will be uh, prevalent. What I, of course, would look at is water corridors, anything where there's a river or good surface water. That's why Minnesota, again, because it's got a lot of surface water, even though it's in a drought, there's probably still very good likelihood that the birds haven't been impacted quite as bad. Um, states like North Dakota that have lots of potholes and lots of cattails around them that are act as cover, that's certainly good, although crop damage is on the opposite end of that is bad. So again, those are just some things that we kind of assess. So that's what we'd be looking for. Uh, and, and then of course, we'll wait and see. The forecast will come out next um, in terms of what the, uh, the forecast for each state, the bird biologists will be coming out with those. And again, you can take those with a grain of salt, uh, knowing that essentially state's revenues are based off of uh, license sales. So you're gonna take that into account when you read a state's report. And if there's backup data behind that, then I think I'd go and look at that. The other thing is, is um, if you want to just go look at any one of your states, you can obviously come over to Ultimate Upland. You can just drop down on any state and figure out where you might want to go. So, you know, pick, pick your state um, and, and it'll show you, of course, we kick it off with the drought monitor. Nevada's not looking great as of August 17th drought report. But it also gives you the license fees, non-resident license fees. It'll tell you what the range of each uh, season is in terms of how long the upland season is um, and each individual species as well. So yeah, if you want to use that to help you as a tool to figure out where you're trying to get to, uh, we certainly encourage you to go to ultimateupland.com and check that out. Um, and the other thing I think as far as uh, how we figure out where we're going to go is we look where everybody else is going to go and we go the opposite direction. So. <laughs> Um, expect to not see us in places where other people would go. I think that that's just because we like to be out there alone um, doing it. 
in a little bit different way. But I think that that's what I would encourage you to do is assess what your own goals are. Are you trying to, um, you know, chase new species? Are you trying to get out by yourself? Are you with a larger group? What's your physical capability? So those things certainly factor in. And, uh, and that's something that we would look at as well. But yeah, um, so those are, that's kind of what's going into uh, this year's planning. We're pretty well locked in on where we're gonna go early season. And um, then we'll kind of go in a wait and see mode after that. Uh, but expect big things from this this year. Uh, if you haven't been following along, make sure you follow uh, us on YouTube. We're releasing the second season of Way Upland, which of course was last year's season. Uh, it shows us uh, going through the state of North Dakota on an overland fat bike adventure. Uh, we were out there for, oh, a long time. <laughs> and so if you want to see what that's like, and of course you can check out uh, season one of Way Upland as well, where we were taking on 14ers in Colorado. Uh, certainly appreciate the support. Uh, and, uh, you know, go ahead and smash that uh, subscribe button for updates. Uh, season three of Way Upland. We start in on that real soon, uh, but the first trip of the year for us will be in about a week we leave. So uh, stay tuned, but that's kind of some tips to help you plan your season, and uh, we look forward to hearing about your adventures.